managing some land organically for seven years and we tried to get it certified at that time, but our records weren't good enough. So it was pretty sad with a group of researchers we didn't keep good enough records, but we learned a lot from that experience and were able to certify our first 10 acres last year in 2012 and then that other eight acres were still working through the process. Um, okay, so today um, I work, I, in my past life when I was out at Washington State, I worked in tree fruit systems, organic orchards, um, just organic orchard floor management work. I'll talk a little bit about that, and it was great to hear your talk on the length of that. Unfortunately, ours didn't last very long, so we only saw the beginning stages. Um, I now at Purdue work primarily in vegetable systems, so are there any vegetable growers here today? Okay, a couple, that's good. All right, great. Um, well, I shortened my talk a little bit um, from what I had sent Jennifer earlier. I kind of dropped off the uh, soil quality bit, both so I could kind of fit the title into this picture here at this research farm in Belgium that I had the opportunity to go to, but also because I gave a version of this talk a couple days ago at the Midwest Organic Farming Conference in Wisconsin with Atina Diffley, who is a longtime vet organic vegetable grower. She, um, she and her husband Martin farm for about 30 years with garden of Egan outside of Minnesota, just great growers, and she just wrote a wonderful new book, too, called um, Turn Here Sweet Corn, which is a great example not only of how to survive in organic vegetable production, but also to really get that marketing aspect in there, and um, so in co-presenting with her, you know, I'm a researcher, so I try to, you know, often focus on data and things like that, where she really focused more on the principles. And so while um, well, my research is really focused on trying to understand soil health, it's a bit of a nebulous concept because we're still trying to learn a lot about how to really properly manage it. And it's also very kind of site specific too. So my talk today is going to be focused a little more on the principles. Oops. I always do this. Okay. Okay, so um, when you think of this is kind of the classic disease triangle that pathologists often use when they're thinking about um, pests and on the farm and, and what happens and causes these outbreaks. And then first you have this susceptible host in the environment, then you have this introduction of this unwanted pest, whether it be a pathogen or some type of insect. And then you have a favorable environment. So your environmental conditions were really conducive to this pest taking hold. And then you have what's called, you know, just this perfect storm of this great opportunity for this pathogen or insect to come in and disrupt your whole system. So my talk today is really trying to focus on each of these three aspects and how to help to try to mitigate some of these pest problems. I don't talk about any products or anything like that, as Jennifer mentioned. Um, we kind of see that as a last resort, you know, once you get something, you can bring in these products, but we want to try to understand how to better manage the system so we won't have to use those as much. So I'll talk a little bit about reducing host susceptibility, preventing these pest introductions, strategies for making the environment less susceptible, and that's really my research with soils, um, practicing on-farm research, so I'm a big proponent of doing on-farm research because um, I think you know what we find on our research farm might not be at all representative of the conditions that are on individual farms. So I try to work a lot with growers to do on-farm research on their farms and um, identify more practical strategies. And then I'll talk just a little bit about mediating some pest outbreaks once you um, get them. So one of the first strategies is just reducing host susceptibility. So if there's resistant varieties out there to a, a pathogen, those are a really nice way to, um, to get at trying to keep these pests out of your system. But as you know, um, you know there's a lot of nice um, heirlooms, things like that in there that you might want to work with, so it's not always um, possible to get resistant varieties. Another thing we're um, really focusing on is varieties bred and or tested in organic production systems. Um, we're starting to see that some of the varieties that are, you know, bred in conventional systems that have a lot of, you know, fertilizer inputs and pesticides might not be the ones that are best suited in organic systems. And this study out of Europe by Hornberg and Becker really nicely um, 
shows this and that they tested 3,500 different accessions of tomatoes in organic systems over several years. And they found that only 12% came from the conventional seed trade. And the ones that really performed the best came more from these organic and non-governmental organization seed savers. Um, so we're working to try to develop new organic varieties. Um, we're starting, we have a tomato project we've been working with the last two years. Um, we're really excited about this little booger here, this tomato hornworm. So in conventional systems, a lot of times we're seeing that um, you know some of the pests that might be more problematic in organic systems might not be addressed in conventional systems like hornworms, where we found very nice resistance in some of the germplasm that we've been testing. And so we're now working with our growers. We're continuing to select in our population and doing a participatory breeding program. And then uh, lastly, varietal mixtures. Um, so there's certainly some nice evidence in wheat and rice systems where if you plant mixtures, of, you know, you might have some susceptible variety that has great market qualities, but interspersing that with um, more resistant varieties can help to keep some of those pests out of your system. So preventing pest introductions, so we just stress really, you know, making sure you know your pests. Um, when you're working in a diversified vegetable rotation, that can be pretty hard to know all the pests that you might be dealing with. But it's really important to think about, you know, which pests are there? Are they generalist pests? Do they, you know, affect lots of different crops or are they very specialist? The specialist um, pests that are more short-lived can be pretty easy to manage by rotation, but some of these, you know, longer-lived very difficult to manage, or some of the generalists like Phytophthora that I work with, it can be pretty difficult. Um, we also say don't forget weeds, so weeds can also serve as reservoirs for some of these pests, so you need to make sure, thinking about that to really design a nice rotation and keeping careful records. As Jennifer mentioned, one of the advantages of organic certification is these careful records, and that can also help you to understand how pest cycles move through your farm, too, when you're rotating. Oops. Okay. Um, so preventing pest introduction, obviously just making sure your um, plants are disease-free, the seeds and the transplants. Um, when you start working, if you're saving your own seed, you might want to do some tests to make sure that your um, seeds are disease-free or who you're working with. Um, always cleaning the equipment. And Tina Diffley that I mentioned earlier, she, you know, they have a pretty large farm, so they actually even rotate equipment around and aren't always bringing the same equipment in the same fields. But you need to make sure and clean it if you're in an infected field um, to get out and clean it up. Uh, scouting regularly. Um, there's the old adage that uh, the best fertilizer on an organic farm is a farmer's footsteps. So we saw that earlier today with the, the couple in the peach orchard. So you need to really be vigilant getting out all the time, scouting, really trying to identify which pests um, that come up, but also your field conditions. So you're going to have a lot of variability in your site and looking at you know which soils might harbor more benefit or more pathogens than others. So really thinking a lot about that. And then acting quickly when pest outbreaks occur, which we'll talk about later. Um, okay, so this is making the environment less favorable. This is where I focus a lot of my research efforts is trying to understand soil health and how we can better manage it to prevent some of these pest outbreaks from occurring. And it's really a balance of the soil, tilth, chemical, and biological properties. So how many of you have had a soil science class? Ah, very good. So you probably, yeah, well versed in all of these types of um, approaches to think about. So tilth, we all know tilth is very important, the structure and the texture of your soil is getting that water to really move in to the system, helping with uh, soil nutrient holding capacity and germination and root prol proliferation. But it can also really affect biological activity. So these, all the microorganisms that live in the soil, many of them you know, need aerobic conditions to thrive and in wet conditions you can get proliferation of pathogens and this is oh what did I do there? My little nemesis there, uh, Phytophthora blight, really likes these wet conditions, so trying to maintain nice drainage. 
if you have compacted soils, there's a lot of deep rooted cover crops that can be used. Um, adding organic matter is another strategy. Really focusing on when you till, uh, trying to reduce the frequency as much as you can, and trying to control traffic. So I was in Australia, I think two years ago, and saw an example of this where they modified their um, tractors to have these wider front tires so you can really uh, concentrate all the compaction and traffic from those tractors right in that row and then maintain your permanent beds where you can have a little bit more um, control over that soil quality. Chemical balance, so this is just your pH, cation exchange capacity, and we all know that's very important for the nutrient holding capacity, soil structure, and it very much affects how available your nutrients are. So there's keeping that balance is really important in terms of, um, you know, there's a lot of micronutrient deficiencies or ex excesses that can lead to pathogen problems and avoiding lots of excess nitrogen. I think we all know nitrogen is a very limiting nutrient, so we have a tendency to pour that on, but it can actually exacerbate pest problems. <laughs> and this diverse and active biological community. So we know, you know the soil is just alive under our feet. In a teaspoon of soil, you can have a, over a million bacterial colonies, lots of fungi, protozoa, and nematodes. And we need to, you know, these organisms are just essential in organic systems, both for making nutrients available, but the plants wouldn't be able to eat without them, um, maintaining structure, plant productivity. We're learning a lot about these very intimate associations between the microbes and plants and how that impacts their ability to uptake nutrients and fight stress. And then pest dynamics. So these organisms are very, very important in mediating or exacerbating pest problems. And so we're trying to, you know, there's no fortunately set recipe right now that we know of, of what combination is going to be best suited to keep your soils healthy. Um, but we do know the more diverse and more active right now can be beneficial. So adding organic matter, these guys need lots of food, um, reducing tillage and living plant cover. So as much as you can, having living plant cover somewhere in your system, the microbes especially really feed off of these fruit exudates that are coming out of the plants and slept off cells. So that can help to keep that system active. Which brings me to disease suppressive soil. So uh, this is a phenomenon that was first discovered in the late 1880s where you, know, you have this pathogen that moves into a system, but it fails to really cause any disease problems, um, even though you have this susceptible host in this very favorable environment. And this uh, picture shows that pretty well, where on the left here you have this suppressive soil. So when these beet seedlings are planted, even though there's a pathogen present, they just they don't succumb to that uh, pathogen, whereas on this other side, in the conducive soil, the pathogen affects the plant. And so we've, there's been a lot of research and a lot of interest in trying to understand this so we can better use this in our cropping systems. And we know that it's biologically mediated by and large. So there's kind of four main mechanisms um, that are responsible, we know, or have been studied in disease suppressive soils. One just being general competition. As I mentioned, the more active and biologically diverse that community is, the harder it is for those pathogens to really come in and get a foothold and take off in those systems. Um, antibiosis, we know there's a lot of microorganisms that are living in the soil that actually produce antibiotics that can inhibit um, pathogens, as you can see in this little Petri dish here. Uh, parasitism, this is where there's, you know, like in this case, a fungi that's eating a nematode in the soil, keeping those in check. And then this last one is this phenomenon known as induced systemic resistance, where we've seen in plants that there's beneficial organisms in the soil that have a signal to the plant, and it actually induces this immune response. So the plant not only is better able to fight off some of the soil-borne pathogens in the soil, but also above-ground pathogens as well. So these foliar blights that might be coming in and even insect pests. So we'll talk a little bit about what is causing this or what might drive it. Okay, next, mycorrhiza, another very important microorganism in the soil. It's very well known for its ability to 
help plants with uptaking nutrients and water, um, healthy keeping the soil aggregated. But we also know it's, or learning that it's very important in pest suppression too, keeping these mycorrhizal relationships um, going underground. So with management, we know tillage can be um, a problem with this. So some of the new research out there in mycorrhiza is that you know it's not just mycorrhiza in general. There's a lot of different species, and when we till the soil, we might actually be um, more preferentially going or disrupting the ones that have better pest suppression or nutrient uptake benefits. Excess nutrients, um, you know, the more you have in that system, the less opportunity, you know, the less. Yeah, relationships between the plants and these organisms that will develop, and then non-mycorrhizal crops. So most of the organ plants in um, that we know of that we work with, most plants are mycorrhizal, but there are some families like the Brassicaceae and Pinopodia, or yeah, Pinopodiaceae that do not form mycorrhiza. And Tina Diffley, I think, you know, made a really good point about this when we were talking, and that vegetable growers actually grow a lot of brassica crops. They're very, um, you know, have high market quality like broccoli. And these are really hard on your soil. So they, you know, don't form the mycorrhizal relationships, and they just tend to be pretty tough. So she always makes sure in her rotation that any time after she plants one of these non-mycorrhizal crops to come in with a soil building crop that can help build those populations or even intercropping soil building crops right next to these brassica species to help to try to maintain that soil quality when she's growing them. There's two general different types of disease suppressive soil. Um, one is specific suppression, and this is where there's a very specific um, antagonist or beneficial organism that preys upon that um, pathogen in the soil. And so wheat and wheat systems with take all decline is one of the most famous examples of this, where you have this take all pathogen and there's a beneficial organism in the soil, Pseudomonas fluorescence, that produces an antibiotic 2,4-DAPG, which um, suppresses that pathogen. And these have these have developed over time in monoculture systems where initially there's you know, the wheat is susceptible, but then after a number of years, you have this disease suppressive soil. So we've also seen this in potato systems. Wouldn't recommend this as a strategy, um, but we do are learning a lot about it. And so there's a lot of interest in developing these commercial inoculants of these species that are very good um, at facilitating these relationships. And so we've done a little research in my lab with trichoderma inoculants, and we do see a short-term increase when we're transplanting these into the field. They have um, better, they tolerate transplant stress level, better get a little bit of a, um, a boost, but it tends to be short-lived. And so, you know, you have to be careful with some of these inoculants, and one of the things we had, you know, now a metaphor that people like to use is when you apply these, you know, it's like planting a plant in the desert and expecting it to survive without water, because these organisms are going to be competing with everything else in the soil. So I think strategies that focus more on you know, trying to boost native levels might be a better long-term approach. And that brings us to general suppression, which is the other type of disease suppressive soils where it is a broad phenomenon. It's a function of the overall soil health. It tends to be very highly correlated with overall microbial activity in soil. It tends to be multiple action mechanisms of action. So whether uh, there might be some antibiosis going on, some induced systemic resistance. And so we know it can be management and induced. This is some of Walter Goldstein's work out of Washington State University years ago where he just demonstrated um, using cover crops in rotation with wheat, you can develop, induce this more disease suppressive soil. So it's important to think about though that there, you know, your soil isn't like suppressive or non-suppressive, it's kind of a continuum, so you have to work to developing um, better strategies for that. In terms of approaches to go or try to induce disease suppressive soil, there's been a lot of interest in these compost inoculants. And Sir Robert Howard was the first one to really make the link to compost and soil health. And there's been a lot of research. Harry Hoyting's lab at Oregon, Ohio State University looked at container-based systems. And was, they found very clear relationships between the compost they were applying and the ability 
to suppress these pathogens in soil and induce systemic resistance. Um, and this little picture shows it really nicely here where um, on the far left you have a little seedling that went into the control soil where there's pathogens. Um, we can pasteurize the soil, kill everything, and you get a nice response. And then the three on the right, though, this was just compost amendments. And so you see that the roots are much healthier. Not only are they bigger, like the steamed ones, but they're whiter. So there's a lot going on in that compost. Um, unfortunately, in field systems, it's been a lot more variable. It's not as black and white as we see in con uh, container-based systems. This is something we're trying to figure out or learning about or trying to learn about in my program through on-farm research to understand how we can um, better facilitate this type of approach. So what we do know is that the suppressive activity tends to be linked with this general biological activity in these composts and inhibitory compounds as they are decomposing. Um, but not all of these composts are suppressive. It really depends on the feedstocks that you're using, the processing conditions, and then the pathogens. So some composts can be very inhibitory to one pathogen and not the other. Um, Unfortunately, there's still no reliable tests or perfect recipes to really determine whether your compost is going to be suppressive or not. So again, I think um, this is where on-farm experimentation really comes into play. Uh, so there are some general recommendations, though. How many of you make your own compost on the farm? Okay, you're good. Yeah. So. Hunting's lab has, you know, the work that they did in container-based systems that, you know, you need to make sure it's very stable, mature, um, curing a long curing time, keeping it really moist. So this is after that heating process when it's cooling down. Um, that's where the inoculation with the beneficials comes in. And you can add some there and incorporating several months before planting can help. And there's also some interest lately in these high carbon to nitrogen ratios. Composts or ones made with hardwood bark, these might be a little bit more suppressive. And some great research lately with vermicompost really showing disease suppression in container systems as well as um, insects in greenhouse systems down in the southeast they found recently. But again, a lot of this work has been in container-based systems, so taking it out to the field can be a little more challenging. Um, there's interest in other types of amendments that you can apply. Um, one of those, when I was over in Europe, they talked a lot about this craft pine lignin. This is a byproduct of the forestry industry, a very high C to N ratio um, byproduct that they're putting on soils. And in some cases, as you can see here, in one soil, in the least soil here, this is the control where they have the rhizoctonia, they add that and they get really nice uh, disease suppression. But in another soil, this first soil, they, while they saw some suppression, it wasn't statistically significant. So that's, you know, where, you know, there's not one recipe whether it's going to work or not. You have to try it out a little bit. Um, another inoculant that's getting a lot of it, or comp, or product that's getting a lot of attention lately is this biochar, um, which is famous for this well, its ability to create the terra preta soils in the Amazon where they've applied this, you know, um, carbonaceous, these amendments that were uh, made under very high heat but low oxygen conditions and it helps sequester carbon in the soil, reduce greenhouse gases and all that. And there's some recent work um, in Israel using these in container-based systems with tomatoes and pepper really showing induced systemic resistance both to foliar pathogens as well as insects. Um, and this work by Elmer and Pignatella looking with asparagus. And we've played with it a little bit in my lab. We're kind of trying to work with it. And we have seen some really crazy um, responses in terms of plant growth and some induced systemic resistance. Um, but I just want to caution you with these types of approaches that these are you know, very tough to decompose compounds. So I would not at all recommend going out and applying these all over your farm because you see you know, some little study or there's some company that makes a claim about these. You think you have to try them out a little bit um, on a small scale. And so there's a lot of these types of products out there and figuring out what works best for you can be a challenge. So crop rotation, I don't think I have to beat this to death. We all know that crop rotation is very important. Um, building soil quality and disrupting pest cycles. But 
figuring out what works best for you can be a little bit more of a challenge. Um, this is a picture I took from Atina Diffley, her side of their talk in Wisconsin, Moses meeting, and you know, she makes the argument, so you, know, you think about rotation and time, but you also have to think about spatially, you know, taking a bird's eye look at your farm, like the pictures that Jennifer showed, and how can you integrate diversity all throughout that system using, you know, hedgerows and um, plantings for beneficial insects, beetle banks, grass strips, whatever you can do to, you know, put as much diversity in your system as possible. Um, same thing, you know, with both from the bird's eye view, you need to look at underground as well and think about how your crop rotation is going to build those uh, your soil. So thinking about these very deep-rooted fibrous crops or roots that, you know, are better at building soil quality with, you know, some of these, a lot of our vegetable crops are very shallow-rooted. Um, they don't have a lot of root mass, so thinking about how to fit that into the rotation. Um, this is, you know, Elliot Coleman's classic example is, you know, he kind of lays out this nice recipe of how to do this rotation, which is really nice. It works very well for him in Maine, but one of the things that Tina pointed out, which I thought was neat, was that it doesn't work for her. A lot of the strategies that Elliot Coleman uses, like um, growing potatoes after sweet corn in Minnesota, she gets a huge buildup of wireworms. So you need to really make sure not only, you know, reading something out of Maine might not work for Utah, so really understanding um, more of the principles. And that's just going through all of these um, principles. There's a new book out. How many of you have seen this book out of Cornell by Chuck Muller's group? I recommend you look at it. This is a wonderful manual where they really walk you through all of these principles and how to develop a nice rotation um, that will help to try to manage pests and build your soil on the same time. Of alternating, you know, infixing and demanding deep, shallow-rooted crops and alternating this autumn spring crops. Um, they also talk about including trap crops. This was my first attempt at using trap crops last year, and it worked really well. Um, I used a, this was my cash crop back here, delicata squash, and we have these blue hubbers here that are much more susceptible to the squash bugs, and so it worked really great in keeping them out, but one thing I didn't do was keep a constant supply of the blue hubbers on hand to keep replanting, because once these all died, they moved into my delicata, so keep that in mind. Um, soil building crops. Um, there's a lot, many different ways to try to in, integrate these into your system from these um, winter crops. We know they add a lot of nutrients, um, build organic matter, trying to reduce tillage. This is something we're working with at Purdue is these roller crimpers that came out of Rodale. Is anybody here using a roller crimper? Okay, great. Yeah, well, these, so these are, this is trying to do no-till organic, so it's very challenging, and to be honest, we haven't had a lot of success with it. I don't know if you have either. Um, you know, we've worked very hard to try to get that rye right at the right step, the right moisture, but we actually have had more luck with a flail chopper, really. But um, I'd like to keep playing with this, finding the right mixture of cover crops to work with so we can you know, get the benefit of those cover crops in and not the, the tillage if we can. Um, mixtures, this is another thing we're playing with. A lot of people, when they think about cover crops, you know, you always think about getting nitrogen into the system using vetches and clover. But the research that's out there, you know, we're starting to come out is that more diversity in that system with the mixtures, we might actually be increasing populations of those beneficials more than just with the straight legumes. So that's something um, we're kind of working with. Um, smother, smother crops, Jennifer mentioned buckwheat, we work with that a lot too. Beautiful crop, make sure you don't let it go to seed. Um, provide a lot of beneficial habitats. I heard a lot of laughs, do people have that problem? <laughs> yeah, um, so and then relay cropping, so I'll talk a little bit about intercropping and one of the challenges I've, you know, working with it is that competition. And so in this example, I think this came from Vermont, they, um, you know, once the peppers were fully established, came in with the, the vetch. And so a nice thing about this, as I mentioned, with those ben beneficials underground, keeping living cover everywhere as much as you can by, you know, intercropping, you can facilitate some of these relationships. <laughs> so intercropping, 
really nice habitat. This was something I worked with when I was doing orchard floor management. We tried a number of different strategies from growing living cover crops right in the orchard row. Um, and we found in, in the early orchard there was a lot of competition, but the trees were still healthy. So I wish we could have followed it up 17 years. Unfortunately, they ripped our out, orchard out after we finished our research. So we weren't able to see that. But one of the things that growers we were working with in Washington started using this mow and blow technique where they were growing a lot of cover crop in that dry row and then cutting it and blowing it over. Um, so I mentioned you know, having the living cover some work in vineyards that the mycorrhizal communities can form a bridge between the living cover and um, the orchard crops. And then I actually saw this example in the paper. I thought it was really clever of a grower out in California who kind of took the competition um, thing to his advantage and planting tomatillos in his grapes. So late in the season in grapes, you actually want a little bit of stress to increase the um, increases the fruit production, the sugar. So he would come in um, with these tomatillos and get two crops out of the system. Um, mulch, there's a lot of benefits with that. Um, we've tried that. I use the wood chip mulch also in my study. We did see, though, while the trees were growing pretty rapidly, we did get some nitrogen mobilization. So it was, you know, that very thick, high carbon to nitrogen ratio, biomass going in there. That was a temporary problem. Again, I'd like to have seen it into the future. Um, and weed seeds, uh, both my experience with straw mulch and wood chip mulch is that it can bring in a lot of weed seeds. So make sure you um, find a good source. Oh, shoot, there's my little table that just does the C-to-N ratio. So in developing a plan, um, I think Jennifer mentioned that IPM approach. Fortunately, I wish there was some you know, magic amendment that we could apply and, and your soil would be disease suppressive, but it takes a combination of approaches. You never want to just keep piling on the compost because that can cause a lot of problems too. So really um, trying lots of different approaches to um, find what works. And then again, experimentation, I'm a big proponent of that. I'm sure there's a lot of extension educators throughout your region that would be happy to work with you doing on-farm research. And just briefly, you know, why should you do on-farm research? Because you can help answer a question. Um, there's a lot of products out there. You know, I get people calling me all the time, you know, what about this product? What about that product? I wish I had time to test them all, but I don't. So I think it's up to you to kind of try those out a little bit and find out really what works best for you. Just a couple resources you hopefully are aware of with SARE and the Organic Farming Research Foundation that have published really nice booklets that tell you how to do on-farm research that walk you through all the steps in terms of you know, laying it out, finding the appropriate control, um, taking good notes, and doing the statistics, and then there's some grant opportunities. So lastly, once you do get pests, what can you do? First of all, you need to identify exactly what it is, what you're dealing with. And a lot of people at my talk in Wisconsin say, oh, what about this, what about that? Well, I don't know what it is. You're going to have to you know, work with your experts, your extension agent, send it off to a place. Find out what it is so you can develop the appropriate strategy for dealing with that. And you might want to work quickly to remove that vegetation, get it out of the field if it is diseased. Um, in terms of insects, there's some evidence with fall tillage you can help disrupt some of those pest cycles. And biofuming at cover crops, there's been a lot of really nice um, studies out there using these in potato systems and snap bean and others. That, um, and these, a lot of these are brassica species, so they have glucosinolates in them. When they break down to isothiocyanates, they you know, act kind of like chemical fumigant compounds and can really do a lot to remediate um, your soils. This is just a recent study came out of um, Michigan State University. Matthew Nagoyu's work kind of looking at some of these different species, and he found seeding date or seeding rate is really um, critical in this. You don't want to overseed or else that actually reduces the um, effect that you get. And make sure you delay your planting. So any, you know, while you're remediating your soil, there's all this biological activity going on. So you don't want to plant your cash crop. Um, wheat cropping, this was something when I was at Washington, I worked with apple replant disease, which is this complex of these pathogens that build up in the soil and we wanted to find an organic way 
to mediate those. So we actually um, were looking at a lot of different, we looked at a number of different wheat, annual wheat varieties as well as perennial wheat, which is where you take an annual wheat and cross it with its perennial well, ancestor, you know, we do wheatgrass, and you get this beautiful system here. And what we found is um, both annual wheat and our perennial wheat did really good. This is traveling this kind of trans in the soil. We ripped out the apple orchards, planted wheat, um, but it really depended on the variety. And so we found wheat varieties bred in organic systems were better able to remediate the soils. So they increased these populations of beneficials that had an antagonistic um, effect. So um, one thing about this, you know, if you're an orchard manager and you're ripping out an orchard, you might not want to take a year off to plant wheat. And so we, you know, we would, we would have wanted to follow it up and actually plant that as a living cover in a mature orchard and try to remediate those populations before you actually took the orchard out. Brassica seed meals, this is another thing I worked a little bit with out in Washington. Um, my old mentor, Mark Mazzola, has done a lot of work with these. Um, the article with Cohen there, they use these brassica seed meal mixtures, so these are byproducts of the biodiesel industry um, that you can apply to the soil, and they're very good at remediating these pathogens, both through chemical and biological um, approaches. Um, I work with these in my living orchards here. They also provided a little bit of weed suppression, um, not a lot, but they also provided a lot of nitrogen, which is nice. These are six to seven percent nitrogen. Um, but we did see a little bit of early season iron chlorosis, so you need to be careful with timing. And then uh, Mike Cohen and Mazzola are doing a lot of work with these in strawberry systems now out in California. Just want to touch on soil solarization. This is a strategy mostly used um, or being looked at in California and um, Florida where you can you know, lay out some black pla or clear plastic to heat up the soil. But this is kind of a broad approach, so I wouldn't recommend that uh, only as a last resort. Um, lastly, just resources. These are three great books put out by Sarah. If you don't have these in your library, you should make sure and get them. They're relatively cheap. I think around twenty to thirty dollars each. But the nice thing is, is they're also online. You can go and get um, these resources, and they just get this Muller book on rotation. Um, this book here, just talking about general soil quality parameters, and then the cover crop book is um, great. So with that, I'll stop talking and be happy to answer a couple questions. Yes? Have you done much with incorporating mycorrhizal and like fungi species into vegetable production? Um, you know, so the question is um, looking at mycorrhizal inoculants in vegetable production. And I haven't specifically looked at that. We were looking more at like wild populations and how you can She didn't do a proper control, unfortunately, but when you know, whenever she would grow those brassica crops, she always came through and added an inoculant just to make sure to try to repopulate her soil. Yeah? This would probably be a whole other presentation, but any quick recommendations or references for incorporating animals into these systems or soils and festivals? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think there's tons of benefits. So the question is, huge hog operations and, and the vegetables, but I think there's great opportunities. There's a lot of great work with foraging animals to help you know, clean up um, insects on the ground. I just saw a great study in Michigan State where they actually took hogs into apple orchards and used the hogs to clean up a lot of the apple material that dumped on the ground, and so that was a great way to keep the pests out of that system. So yeah, lots of opportunity. How many people in here have integrated livestock, vegetable? Good, great. Yeah. Question. One, one quick comment from the point of view of certification and food safety, you have to keep them out for that 120 or 90 day interval. But for cleanup, post harvest, that's I think yeah. where the real. Yeah, 
very good point. Do you know of any good studies that have been done on compost peas and building soil health, or have you done studies on that? Yeah, I haven't. Um, I just talked to a girl though at the Moses Conference who's starting some projects on that at Michigan State University. Um, so it's a lot like compost. The research I've seen in the literature is that you know in some cases it works really well, in other cases it doesn't. And I think that comes back a lot to you know just like with compost, it's all the feedstocks and how you process it. Well, you make compost tea, and that's a whole other layer on top of that. So um, I think there is a lot of work to be done on fiddling with it and finding the right approach. But yeah, I have seen some positive and negatives. Yeah. Can you do the back one? Maybe I need to hear. Where is that? Sure. is using turnips as a cover crop and there's um, a lot of interest out in the Midwest of these um, tillage radishes. radishes. People are using those a lot to um, help develop or really break up the compaction layer. Um, but they, they have a little bit of controversy and that they kind of smell bad sometimes when they're decomposing so that's people there's like lawsuits flying around now over that unfortunately. Um, and you know but right, I think if they do certainly have benefits you have to be careful if you're, you know, it's a brassica again, you know, how many, if you're a vegetable grower, how many veg brassicas do you want in that system? So, in advising vegetable growers, I would say if there's another grain crop or something that you can break the cycle, that that might be more advantageous. Questions? Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for um, inviting me out here. It's great.